When it comes to doing developmental research, there's four standard methods you could use. Or in other words, there's four ways you can measure human development. They are systematic observation, where you basically just watch people and you carefully record what they say and do. You could also do uh, se uh, a sampling of a behavior by using a task of some sort. You know, you basically have the participant just come to your laboratory and answer some questions, play a game, that kind of stuff. The whole point is you want to try to get them to do the behavior you're interested in. And then you could also use another method, uh, which would be self-report. So that's basically like an interview or a questionnaire. You know, I'm sure you're very familiar with questionnaires. You just ask the people a series of questions and then they either uh, respond in the form of a short answer or maybe a linear scale or multiple choice, you know, those kinds of things. And then the fourth way that you could measure human development is by just going straight to the person's body and taking physiological measures. So measuring things like heart rate, measuring things like brain activity, you know, that kind of stuff. But the one that's most classically associated with human development, because it has been used pretty extensively in psychology, is uh, systematic observation. So that's where you just basically watch people and you take notes. And there's a couple ways you could do a systematic observation. You could do what's called a naturalistic observation, which is where you just observe people in a real life situation. You know, you, you go out into the real world and you just hang out and you take notes and you look at what people are doing in this environment. Like maybe you go to the mall, maybe you go to a public park, you know, a, a place where people tend to gather and do stuff and you just wait for people to do something interesting. That can be a great opportunity to learn quite a lot about human behavior. And everybody loves to people watch, so now you're doing it for science. <clears throat> Or, if that sounds really boring and not very efficient, you could do something different. Uh, it's called a structured observation. So this is where, instead of just going out into the real world, you create an artificial little environment, usually in your laboratory, to try to get people to act in certain ways. So you create this environment, put people in it, and then watch how they react to that environment. The whole idea here is you're trying to elicit the behavior of interest. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a laboratory. You could do it at a public park or in a shopping mall. The whole point of a structured observation, though, is that you have modified that environment in some way because you want to observe a certain kind of behavior. <clears throat> and this is very useful when studying behaviors that don't happen very often. Now, Naturalistic observations, uh, structured observation, those are really useful, but like I said, they can also be very inefficient. They can take you a very long time to get people to do something interesting that you could actually you know, do some research on. Uh, a much more efficient method is sampling that behavior by using a task. So this often does take the form of like little games that you can have your participants play to try to determine their capabilities or measure some characteristic within them. This technique is in fact very popular and convenient. My own research when I was working on my PhD was sampling behavior. You know, I'd have my participants come to the laboratory, have them sit down and do some stuff on the computer. It was pretty boring stuff, but the whole point was I was getting directly at the behavior I was interested in and I was getting some pretty good data. So it worked out pretty well for me, and in, most researchers would agree that this is the way to go. But there is a problem here, and that is when you have people come in and play this little game, what are, is it exactly that you're measuring? You know, are you actually measuring a real human behavior, or are you measuring this weird abstract performance on your game? Because no matter how good the game is, it's never going to be the real thing. So it's kind of hard to you know, do that leap of logic from this abstract game you've created 
to real human behavior. So to make it short, you know, the game might just not be good enough. It might, be, might not be accurate enough when compared to the real thing. So if that if that doesn't sound like a good idea, you could go with the self-report. Self-report is another really popular method. You know, that's where you just basically ask people questions in the form of either a questionnaire or an interview. Rating scales are very popular for good reason. You know, where you have people rate whatever it is about themselves on a scale of like 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 or something like that, where they can indicate whether they like strongly agree or strongly disagree. Those are very common, but there are some great things you can get from doing a self-report and also some real big problems of doing a self-report. One of the obvious downsides is that you can't really use self-report method if your participants aren't both responsive, you know, able to communicate with you effectively and also introspective. They have to understand themselves. So if you want to do research with little, little kids, you can forget about it. They, they don't know what's going on. They can't communicate what's going on. It's not going to work. The only thing that you can potentially use a self-report for effectively would be, you know, older individuals like teenagers and adults, people who understand themselves much, much better. But one method that is particularly very useful with the youngest of individuals but even individuals that haven't been born yet, is physiological measures. <clears throat> the only real problem with doing physiological measures is deciding which ones to use because there's so many different things you could measure. You could measure anything from heart rate to galvanic skin response to brain activity in various parts of the brain. You could measure uh, neurochemical levels. You could measure uh, eye movements. You know, th there's a whole long list of things, and like I said, it's really the tricky part is just picking the right things to measure because you can't necessarily measure everything simultaneously. That would just be incredibly, uh, you know, inefficient and ineffective. It's just too much stuff going on. So you really need to understand the behavior you're interested in and the subject you're studying in order to choose the best measures for that individual. For example, if you want to measure how interested an infant is in something, you could measure their galvanic skin response and pupil dilation because we know those are two things that will change when an, when an infant you know, becomes interested in some stimulus. <clears throat> And if you're doing this kind of research where you're looking at how the physiological changes are connected to psychological activity, what you're basically doing now is called neuroscience. You know, the study of how the brain and the nervous system are related to behavior. So those brain behavior relationships. And we've learned quite a lot about that connection. And we've basically come to the conclusion as a field, as, you know, psychology and biology what we've dis what we've basically discovered is that they're the same biology is psychology and psychology is biology if you know the if you can understand the physical brain then you can understand the psychological mind so let's say you choose one of these uh, methods and now you want to get started with your research well, the next step is to choose a general research design. And there's three basic ways you could go when it comes to human development. You could do correlational research, which is quite popular. That's where you just look at relationships between variables as they exist naturally in the world. Like, is you know this variable related to that variable in some way? But that doesn't really tell you all that much. All it really tells you that these two variables may or may not have a relationship. It doesn't explain what that relationship means. If you want to know what that relationship means, then you have to do something else. It's called an experimental study. So this involves the systematic manipulation of a key factor, key variable, that the investigator thinks is causing some change in a particular behavior. 
So in, in this case, on the right side here, we, we believe factor A can cause a change in factor B. So we should be able to manipulate A to see changes in B. If we can demonstrate that kind of cause effect, then we have identified a causal relationship here. So that's one thing that experimental research can do that correlational studies just can't. But then you also have qualitative studies, which are very popular in human developmental research because they help us to gain just an in-depth understanding of human behavior and what governs it. You can see in this little illustration on the right, what we're basically doing is we're trying to understand one thing and just kind of branch out from there and see what it's connected to. We want to know all about that behavior and the best way to do it is to just follow that individual and do numerous, numerous observations to see under what context it occurs. <clears throat> but we have very specific designs when we use these kinds of general research designs. So whether you're going to do a correlation or an experiment, you're going to have to do it in one of these kinds of contexts because human development is something that uh, requires studying change over time, obviously. So you could do just that. You could do something called a longitudinal study where you examine one group and then after a period of time, you examine them again. So that's what you see at the top here. You know, the single group of people measured at time one compared to time two. But as you can imagine, this is quite expensive and can be rather time consuming. And if you want to measure change over the entire lifespan, you know, from conception to death, this is not going to work out. You're not going to be able to do a longitudinal study on such a grand scale because you're not going to live that long, right? Like you're looking at the huge long lifespan and you're just a human and you can't, you can't measure that entire lifespan by yourself. So most researchers don't really uh, want to do these kinds of longitudinal studies because it can be incredibly inefficient. So what they prefer instead is called a cross-sectional study. So this is where you do all your observation at one period of time and you do that by comparing different groups. So on the left side here, we have one group of individuals, let's say they're teenagers. And on the right side, we have a different group of individuals. Let's call those the elders. So we can measure the teenagers, compare them to the elders and see if there's any kind of interesting developmental difference between them. Obviously, this isn't perfect. You know, we in a perfect world, we would be able to examine uh, individuals to an identical version of the, their older self, but that just that's not realistic. So what we have to do is we need to find, in this case, a teenager and an elder, which are incredibly similar, and the only difference between them is their age. But that's not going to be perfect. So cross-sectional studies, while they are preferred, they do have some serious flaws. So what you could do to to try to compensate for those flaws is called a sequential study. It's basically just a combination of these two methods of the longitudinal and cross-sectional. So you're looking at two groups of individuals of, of different age groups, like teenagers and elders, and, and you measure them at the same time, but then you also track them over a period of time. So you're doing a cross-sectional study longitudinally this gives you the benefits of both methods and this is a pretty if you can do this if you have the time and resources to do this this is highly preferred uh, d developmental research strategy but when it comes to doing developmental research no matter what kind of methods you're using no matter what kind of design you choose you're going to be making some interesting conclusions for the most part. You know, a lot of this developmental research has yielded some really interesting uh, applications. Developmental research in general has the one of the biggest potentials for application because the things we learn from doing this kind of research can help us to better shape the environments for our children and elders and adults, people of all ages, to help them to grow and to you know, develop their own individual skills and capabilities to the fullest of their 
uh, extent. And just to mention a few applications that have, you know, come out of this research, I have this list here. So one question that a lot of politicians have asked is, should things like pre-K educational programs be made free for all children? Well, the research is pretty clear on that. It seems to show that that is a good idea. Those, when children are involved in pre-K, it is gonna cost a little bit extra if we have the taxpayers pay for it, but the end result is a net gain. You know, these individuals are gonna be committing less crimes, they're gonna be more productive in the future. There's, it's, it's just good overall. The research seems pretty clear about that. Another application that's come out of the research is what should the legal age limits be for things like driving, drinking, smoking, having sex, etc. And you're not going to like what the research has said about this, but basically what we found is that the human brain, you know, the human developmental system has not fully developed its capability to understand consequences of actions and be able to restrain itself. You know, like those mature aspects to adult thinking, that kind of stuff doesn't fully develop until your mid-twenties. So this is never going to work, but the science would suggest that we should probably hold off on doing all of these kinds of things that could have serious consequences until you're about in your mid-twenties and you can think about this in a more mature way. But yeah, like I said, I don't think that's ever going to fly. That's just what the science shows. Uh, other applications are things like should mothers who willfully expose their children to teratogens, like mothers who smoke or drink, should they be arrested for abuse? Should this be considered abuse? This is obviously a social issue. Uh, I'm just sharing the science with you, but the science clearly shows that this stuff is bad for kids. And as this is becoming more widespread knowledge, it is becoming a serious you know, topic of discussion as to what the consequences of purposefully exposing your kids to this stuff should be. And then one final one I wanted to mention is under what circumstances should abortion be legally allowed and provided? Now I know abortion is a pretty controversial subject for a lot of individuals, but the science has shown us quite a lot about, you know, various stages of development and what those stages mean for the person as a developing individual. So as we talk about this uh, kind of stuff, as we go into the future videos, you'll see what I mean here. You'll see that there are various stages in development that generally have been considered to be acceptable for you know l the legal definition of abortion, but those, those things are changing and our understanding is changing. So it's going to be interesting where the research takes us in the future be because we are learning quite a lot about these kinds of subjects.